Hey guys, here is a brief summary of everything that you need for your AQA, AS and A-level biology topic 2 cells. Now this is just one chunk of the information, there is the whole long video as well which is everything for AQA, A-level biology but if you just want this bit here it is. Don't forget to go with this, there is the free vision guide which you can download from my website, there is the course over on my website, there is the essay booklet over on my website, the gloss booklet over on my website all available for immediate download to help you revise and do better in your exams what i strongly suggest you do is with the free revision guide it goes in context with this video so go there and check off the bits that you do know and check off the bits where you need to go and watch the separate more detailed video we'll be going to things in a lot more detail and go through a lot more examples for example with the practicals here is just one short slide in a minute two minutes three minutes whereas i've got a whole long 10 minute video where we go into everything in detail for you um so happy origin guys You need to be familiar with all of the different structures within a eukaryotic cell, both plant cells and animal cells, and the function of all of those different organelles. Both plant cells and animal cells have a nucleus. This is where the chromosomes are located. The chromosomes are made up of wound up DNA and it is enclosed all within a nuclear envelope. There is a double membrane around the nuclear envelope and the nucleus is in charge of controlling the cell's activity. Both plant cells and animal cells have a cell surface membrane. This is made up from lipids and proteins. This cell surface membrane controls the movement of things in and out of the cell. They both have mitochondria. This has a double membrane and the highly one is very heavily folded. It is here that the enzymes involved in respiration and the production of ATP can be found. The tiny black dots in both of them are ribosomes. These are very small. They can be found either on the rough endoplasmic reticulum or in the cytoplasm. This is the place where proteins are made. Both animal cells and plant cells have a Golgi apparatus. This is a fluid filled membrane that produces new lipids and new proteins. Budding off from the Golgi apparatus, you're going to have a Golgi vesicle. This buds off and stores and transports the new lipids and proteins. There are some organelles that are only found in plant cells. The green chloroplasts are the location of photosynthesis. It has a double membrane and the inside membranes are thylakoid membranes. Both animal and plant cells will have a rough endoplasmic reticulum, very similar in shape to the smooth ear, but this one is covered in ribosomes. This is where it processes proteins that are made within the ribosomes. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, also found in both animal and plant cells, is a site of synthesis and processing of lipids. Lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. Being in a lysosome keeps them separate from the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is where most of the reactions within a cell actually take place. Plant cells will also have a cell wall. This ensures the cell structure is maintained. The vacuole that is found in plant cells contains sap and helps to maintain the cell shape and the cell structure. 
by maintaining the pressure and keeping the cells rigid. Eukaryotic cells can be adapted in a range of ways to suit their functions. For example, this sperm cell here has a tail and it has lots of mitochondria just behind the head to help it swim. Epithelial cells will have a large number of villi to increase their surface area. Fat cells are used for storage of lipids that can be turned into energy at later points. Red blood cells are concave and have no nucleus, so there's more space for carrying oxygen around in. Nerve cells are very long. And there is a wide range of adaptations seen in white blood cells to suit their specific function. There is a hierarchy starting with cells, tissues, organs and organ systems because cells do not work alone. If we have a group of cells with a similar function, then this is a tissue. In this example, we have all of these cells working together to work as a muscle tissue. There are lots of different types of tissues within a body. For example, connective tissue, muscle tissue, nerve tissue or epithelial tissue. A group of different tissues that are working together is an organ. Again, there are lots of different types of organs within a body and you need to be aware of these. For example, skin, heart or liver. Groups of different organs working together towards a common function or a common goal are an organ system. For example, the endocrine system, the muscular system, the skeletal system or the digestive system. There are a range of structures within prokaryotic cells that you need to be aware of the function of. Some of these structures will have common features with eukaryotic cells, but not all of them. They have cytoplasm, but it is without any membrane bound organelles. The tiny black dots are the ribosomes involved in protein production. The cell surface membrane will control what goes into and out of cells. And the cell wall is important for keeping structure and containing the glycoproteins. In addition to common features with eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells may have one or several flagella. These are generally very long structures and they are used for motility. The DNA in prokaryotic cells is not contained within a nucleus. It's within the cytoplasm and it is one long coiled strand. There will also be small bits of plasmid DNA. These can be easily passed between bacteria, helping the spread of genes. These genes could be advantageous to the bacteria, for example, antibiotic resistance. They may have capsules on the outside of secreted slime to protect the cell from attack. Viruses are prokaryotic, but they are very different to bacteria and they all have very different structures to each other. If we look here, a bacteriophage looks very different to an Ebola virus, which looks very different to an adenovirus. But within this variation, all viruses have a similar overall structure. On the outside, they will have attachment proteins. This is going to allow the virus to attach to the cell that it's going to inject itself into. They will have a capsid. 
This is a protein coat that is surrounding the nucleic acid. And the nucleic acid can be DNA or it can be RNA. It is important to remember that viruses are not cells and they are not living. They are incredibly small. We are talking 20 nanometers up to about 300 nanometers. And they can only replicate inside a living host cell. They will have an envelope around the outside. This is a protective coat and it is only present in some viruses. In biology, we can work with some very small units. So it is important that you understand the relationship between these and how to convert between them. We can measure people and other large objects in meters, but that is useless when we are talking about very small things. So here is our scale. We are gonna start at the big end with one millimeter. If you can't visualize that, go and grab a ruler now and look at this with the ruler on your desk while we look at this. Getting smaller, 100 micrometers, 100 microns, 10 micrometers, one micrometer, 100 nanometers, 10 nanometers, two nanometers, one nanometer, and then down below that, we can go to picometers and femtometers, but that is more the range of physics. Now, one millimeter is very small, but there are 10 millimeters in one centimeter, which on my screen is this big, and 100 centimeters make up one meter. Now, one millimeter is roughly the diameter of a grain of sand. A grain of pollen is roughly 100 micrometers in diameter. Down at 10 micrometers, we're looking at a red blood cell. Bacteria are roughly one micrometer, whereas viruses are much smaller at around 100 nanometers. Proteins are around 10 nanometers, and with all of these things, there is a range. Whereas DNA comes in at two nanometers, and that will be the diameter of the helix. A buckyball, carbon 60, Buckminster fullerene will come in at one nanometer, and then an atom will be 0.1 nanometers. So these are very small, but you need to keep this scale in mind when we are talking about the measurement of cells, when we are talking about um, microscope calculations, because these are the units that you're going to need to be using and the units you're going to need to be converting between. The most common ones you'll be using are millimetres, micrometres and nanometres. To go from millimetres to micrometres, you times by a thousand and times by another thousand to get to nanometres. To go from nanometres to micrometres, we need to divide by a thousand. And then from micrometres to millimetres, it is again divide by a thousand. You are going to be using those calculations a lot when we're using microscopes. So I suggest you write that on a post-it note and stick it up on your wall somewhere. There are two different types of microscope that you need to be familiar with. We are briefly going to go over them here, but you might need to know them in a bit more detail. These are optical microscopes and electron microscopes. With an optical microscope, you will need light to form an image, whereas an electron microscope will use electrons to form the image. An optical microscope can look at objects which are larger than 0.2 micrometers, whereas an electron microscope can look at much smaller objects, much smaller things. An optical microscope can see things in colour and it can see living specimens. Whereas an electron microscope, you will get a black and white image, which might be pseudo coloured by a computer, and it is dead because it needs to be fixed before it can be put into the electron microscope. An optical microscope will have a maximum magnification of around 
1,500 times, whereas an electron microscope will have a maximum magnification that is much higher than that. This will be around one and a half million times. Here is a beautiful image of a Drosophila eye. Drosophila are fluke flies, those tiny annoying things that are around bananas that have gone a little bit off. They are attracted to this. And you can see the big differences here between an optical microscope image and an electron microscope image. This one is colour and it is live, so this is the actual colour of things. Whereas this one has been pseudo coloured because it will be a black and white image. For the electron microscope, you are getting a lot more details on the hair. Whereas in the optical microscope, you can't really, you can probably guess that there are hairs, but it just kind of looks a little bit fuzzy. Here you actually pick out the individual hairs and you can pick out the root bases, the, the follicles that the hairs are growing out of. Whereas you can't see that at all over here. You get a lot more structure, a lot more detail with the electron microscope, but the image, the, the subject has to be dead. So you cannot take the Drosophila and then look at it under the microscope, look for what you're, you're testing for, and then potentially breed from it. And you have to kill it to be in an electron microscope. I think these images are both stunningly beautiful. It is important that you are familiar with the different parts of an optical microscope. Hopefully you've used one of these in the lab at school or seen somebody use one. We have eyepiece, the base. This is going to be the light source down here. This could be a mirror or it could be a lamp if it's an electrical microscope. This large wheel here is your coarse focus. And the smaller one is your fine focus. There are some objective lenses that come here. And this bit is a wheel which you can turn to switch between the different objective lenses. This is your stage and you'll place your slide in here so that you can view it under the microscope, view it through the eyepieces. The slide is held in with this clip here, which you can move in and out, in and out to put the slide in place and keep it there. Optical microscopes are going to use a convex glass lens. It has a pair of lenses. It has the eyepiece, and then it has the objective lenses. These will generally be four times, 10 times, 40 times, maybe 100 times. You will need a light source coming from below so that you can actually visualize things. Otherwise, it is going to be very, very hard to see anything. An important thing to note about optical microscopes is that resolution is different to magnification. Resolution is the ability to differentiate between two spots to work out there's two things there instead of one thing. In a light microscope the resolution is roughly 0.2 micrometers. Anything closer than 0.2 micrometers apart will appear to be a single object under an optical microscope. The higher the resolution a microscope have, it will give the more precise image. There are two different types of electron microscopes. Transmission electron microscopes and scanning electron microscopes. Transmission electron microscopes have a very high resolution. They can see very small objects, but they need to have a very Thin specimen to image. They work on fixed samples. They have to be dead because it takes place inside a vacuum. And occasionally you will get artifacts of scanning. For scanning electron microscopes, they have a lower resolution. They can be used to image 3D objects. And again, they must have fixed samples. 
Here we have two example images. The first one taken with a transmission electron microscope and the second one taken with a scanning electron microscope. Here you can see the image taken with an optical microscope and you can see here the much more detail you get with the electron microscope. In the scanning electron microscope, we can see the 3D image. It is much thicker than this very thin sample over here. In comparison to an optical microscope, which, well, I have one sitting on my desk, electron microscopes are very, very large. They will generally have their own dedicated room and their dedicated air conditioning unit to keep them controlled. There will be a screen for you to look through, but most of the images you'll be getting are going to be computer generated. You cannot just look through with your eye and see exactly what you're looking for. The samples will go in the middle, well, kind of bottom third of this very large, very tall bit of equipment. The electrons will come from the top and then be focused by various different lenses before they eventually hit the specimen and the images are then generated by the computer. When you have an image under the microscope, you then need to be able to determine the size, the actual real size of that image. And for that, we need to use magnification calculations. The equation that you need to be able to remember is that magnification is the size of the image divided by the actual size of the image. Whenever you get a magnification calculation, the very first thing you should do is to highlight all of the numbers in the text and then convert them so they are the same scale. So you convert microns, uh, micrometers to nanometers, so they're all in the same scale, so you do not get confused. If there is an eyepiece graticule in the question or you've been using one in the lab, then you can use that to measure the size of the image that you are seeing down the microscope. This eyepiece graticule will need to be calibrated for each individual lens magnification that you are using. If you want to look at a particular organelle within a cell and not necessarily the whole thing, a nice thing that you can do is separate out all of the cell components to look at them individually. You can fractionate the cell components by homogenation and then follow that by ultra centrifugation. The first step is going to be homogenization to break down the cell. You can break down the cells either with a blender or you can do it by vibration. Step two is going to be filtration to remove the large parts, either unwanted bits that you are not looking for or parts of cells that haven't broken down fully. And step three is going to be ultra centrifugation in a centrifuge. When a liquid is spun in a centrifuge, the components will separate out. They will separate out by weight. The heavier ones will go to the bottom and you will end up with layers. The supernatant, the liquid at the top, can be removed and then further spun at a faster, a higher speed to continue the separating of components so that all the different parts within the supernatant can be separated out. The cell cycle is the complete pathway around from start to finish. Interphase is from cytokinesis to the next nuclear envelope breakdown. While it may not seem like it, a lot happens during interphase. Very, very roughly, we can say the cell cycle takes 24 hours and 90% of that time is going to be interphase. We have G1. This is gap phase one, 
where the cell is going to grow, having just divided itself in half, it is going to produce new organelles and proteins. S phase is where we get the synthesis of a new DNA. This is where the DNA is replicated so that it can be divided during mitosis. Then we will have G2. This is gap phase two. There is going to be more growth and more new organelles produced. Time-wise is only a very short section of the cell cycle, but a lot happens within this short period of time. It is important that you remember the difference between mitosis and meiosis and that you spell them correctly in the exams. Mitosis produces two daughter cells. And the stupid way that I remember it is that mitosis has a T in it and you can write two. Whereas meiosis that produces four daughter cells doesn't have a T in it. This is not the most genius way ever, but it is really effective for working out the difference between mitosis and meiosis. The daughter cells in mitosis have the same DNA. They have the same number of chromosomes. And they are identical to the parent cells. There are several different stages of mitosis that you need to know the different names for. We start with interphase, followed by prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. The way that I always used to remember the order when I was studying was with IPMAT. I don't know what it stands for, it doesn't really stand for anything. If you can come up with something that it stands for, then leave a comment down below to help other people. Interphase is a period of cell growth and DNA replication. During prophase, the chromosomes will become visible as they condense. Two centrioles will develop in animal cells only, and these are the spindle poles. They will move to opposite sides of the cell. The nuclear envelope will start to break down and the chromosomes are now free in the cell, within the cytoplasm. At metaphase, chromosomes can now be visualised as two chromatids joined by the centromere. The spindle fibres will attach to the centromere on either side and the chromosomes line up in the centre of the cell. Each side is attached to a different chromatid. In anaphase, the centromeres will split and the individual chromatids will start to move towards opposite sides of the cell. During telophase, when the chromosomes reach the opposite poles, they are uncoiled and a new nuclear envelope will start to form around the set of DNA. In cytokinesis, the cytoplasm and organelles will be divided between the two new cells and a new cell membrane will form around the new daughter cells. These new daughter cells will then go on to enter the next cell cycle, entering the G1 phase. Here we're going to be looking at a root tip squash under a microscope, one of my favourite things to do. For this practical, you need to have an actively growing root, which you then put into 5 molar acid to stop any reactions happening. You then need to take a very small section of this root, put it on a slide and stain it. Move it around a little bit to separate out all the slides, pop a cover slip on it and then look at it under the microscope. This is one of my favourite things. 
Once you get your slide under the microscope and you've found what you are looking for, moving it around, adjusting the focus ever so slightly, we need to do a calculation of mitotic index. So start by finding all of the cells that are in mitosis and if you can identify the stage of mitosis that they are in. For our calculation of mitotic index, it is going to be the number of cells that are currently undergoing mitosis divided by the total number of cells. Now the advantage that I've got here is that I have a picture, an image, which means I can actually go through and dot the cells as I am counting them so I don't double count things. So 5 divided by 185 gives us 0 0.03. Now everyone is going to have a slightly different number for this. Some cells are not going to be in the focal plane of the image. Not all the cell membranes are clear in this. But the most important thing when you're counting is that you are consistent in your counting, consistent between slides if you are comparing different conditions. Inconsistency in counting is going to be one of the biggest causes of error in this. Cancer is the uncontrolled division of cells, generally brought about by mutation in the genes that control the cell cycle or control cell division and mitosis. Cancer is an incredibly complicated collection of disease. It is growth of cells in unwanted locations. And it can be caused by lots of different factors. A wide range of different genes can be influenced by an even wider range of factors. And these can have diverse consequences. The treatment for cancer generally revolves around killing the cancer cells. This can either be done by preventing DNA replication or by preventing metaphase in mitosis. The problem with this treatment is that it also kills a large number of healthy cells, generally the rapidly dividing ones, such as the ones for hair growth. Cell division is slightly different in prokaryotic cells. The DNA is not within chromosomes. It is circular DNA within the cytoplasm. There is also plasmid DNA. Both the free circular DNA and the plasmid DNA replicates. The cytoplasm divides and each daughter cell will get the circular DNA and a variable number of the plasmids. And it is these plasmids that are responsible for a lot of traits that bacteria, prokaryotic cells carry, such as antibiotic resistance. Viruses are not alive. Thus, they cannot undergo cell division they cannot replicate by themselves. They will attach to the host cell using their attachment proteins, and then they will inject their DNA into the host cell. The host cell will then start producing this viral DNA. The viral DNA will then instruct the cell's own organelles to produce new virus particles. These new virus particles will then be released into the body. This kills the host cell and the body is then swamped with new viruses. You need to be familiar with the, with the basic structure of all cell membranes. They are complex structures made up of lots of different components combined in lots of different ways. We are going to start by looking at phospholipids. There are two main parts to a phospholipid. The hydrophilic head points towards the outsides of the membrane, whereas the hydrophobic tails 
are internal to the membrane. This arrangement allows lipid soluble materials to move through the membranes. Meaning that lipid soluble materials can enter and exit the cell. The hydrophobic tail stops water soluble materials following this same path. This bilay is knocked fixed and is constantly moving around, meaning it is flexible and self healing. There are lots of proteins, lots of different proteins within the structure of the cell membrane. They each have different functions. We can have carrier proteins or channel proteins, which will help molecules move through the membrane. We can have receptor proteins, which will allow the cell to recognize and respond to external stimulus, to recognize what is happening within that environment. Glycoproteins are proteins that have carbohydrate groups attached to them. These can act as cell surface receptors for things like hormones and neurotransmitters. Cholesterol is found within the phospholipid bilayer. It helps to give the membrane strength and stability. It has hydrophobic properties, which help the hydrophobic tail of the phospholipids to hold together. This further prevents water loss. Cholesterol will increase the close packing of the phospholipid. This reduces the movement in the bilayer, making the bilayer more rigid. Being able to break down long complex words really helps you understand what they mean. Here we have glycolipids. Glyco means sugars or carbohydrates and lipids means lipids, the fat parts. So a glycolipid is a lipid that have carbohydrates bound to them. This helps form attachments and for signal recognition. The fluid mosaic model of plasma membranes was developed in the 1970s as a way to describe the movement of the different components within the plasma membrane. It is fluid because the phospholipids and other components of the membrane are not fixed in place and can move around. It is a mosaic. Due to the wide range of different shapes and sizes of the parts that make up the membrane. For one of the required practicals, we need to determine the water potential of potato tubers. For this, it is important you have the same size tubers, so same diameter, same thickness, same surface area, if possible. They do not need to weigh exactly the same, but they need to be roughly the same. You need to dry and weigh these, and then you need to incubate them at different concentrations of sucrose solution. After the incubation, you need to dry and weigh them again. Then we can work out our calibration curve, plotting all the points, drawing a line of best fit, and then working out where there is zero change in weight. This probably won't correlate to one of the samples that you've tested, as that would be unlikely. But if we go across and down or up and across, depending on which way you've drawn your graph, at zero change, then we can work out where the water potential would be the same in the constant of sucrose solution and in the potato tubers. This will probably vary between the type of potatoes that you are using, how old the potatoes are and conditions in the lab. Whenever you get a question about osmosis, you need to be extra careful with your wording. This is one of the topics where 
a really careful definition, a really well learned definition will do you really, really well because you can just write this down in the exam as the answer. Here is my definition from my glossary booklets. Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules from a region of high water potential to a region of lower water potential across a partially permeable membrane. So here we have our water molecules and in the middle our partially permeable membrane. We can see that they will fit through. We also have our solute in green. It is very large and will not fit through the gaps in the partially, partially permeable membrane. On the right hand side of the membrane, there are no solute molecules. This has a high water potential. On the left hand side of the membrane, there are more solute particles. This has a lower water potential. Now, since the solute particles cannot move across. It is the water molecules that will move across from the area of higher water potential to the area of lower water potential. When the water potential on either side of the membrane is equal, net movement stops and a dynamic equilibrium is established. So this isn't saying that all movement stops, just net movement stops. If we get something diffusing in this direction, we will also get it diffusing in this direction. That is your dynamic equilibrium. We're going to use red blood cells as an example of looking at osmosis in animal cells. The cell membranes of these are very thin and fragile. If we put them into an external solution that has a lower water potential, water will leave the cell and this cell will shrink. If we put them into an isotonic solution, which is a solution that has equal water potential, there will be no net movement of water. A dynamic equilibrium will be established where the same amount of water goes in that goes out. If we put them into an external solution which has a higher water potential than the cell, water will enter the cell and the cell will eventually burst. Osmosis in plant cells is slightly different to osmosis in animal cells. If you put a plant cell into an external solution that has a higher water potential, water will enter the cell the protoplast swells up and the cell becomes turgid. If you put a plant cell into an external solution that has a lower water potential than the cell, water will leave the cell and the protoplast will shrink. The cell will become plasmalized. One of the required practicals is looking at the effect on alcohol concentration on the leakage of pigment from cells. The purple pigment will be kept inside cells by healthy membranes, whereas damaged membranes will leak out the pigment. For this, you need to make a standard solution. We are going to be using this standard solution to compare our tests against. You need to incubate your beetroot discs at different concentrations of alcohol and then compare the colour to the standards. To make this more accurate, to make it a quantitative test instead of a qualitative test, we could use a colorimeter to measure absorbance and then we could draw a calibration curve to work out exactly where things lined up. Simple diffusion is another example of where having a clear definition in your mind will serve you really, really well in an exam setting. Diffusion is the net movement of molecules or ions from a region where they are more highly concentrated to one where their concentration is lower 
until they are evenly distributed. Molecules or ions will move down a concentration gradient. Particles are always in constant motion and that movement is random. And at random, they will become evenly distributed over time. Now, not everything can just pass through the plasma membrane. Small particles and non-polar particles, for things that need a little bit of help passing through the membrane, we have facilitated diffusion. For example, charged ions and polar molecules will need a bit of help with diffusion. This is to avoid the lipid bilayer. Channel proteins allow these particles to diffuse. No ATP is needed for this as it is a passive process. Active transport is yet another phrase that needs a careful definition. It is the movement of molecules or ions into or out of a cell from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration using ATP and carrier proteins. A molecule will enter the carrier protein. It will bind to the receptor. ATP will be converted to ADP and this will trigger a change in the shape of the carrier protein, meaning the molecule can be released to the opposite side of the channel. There are lots of adaptations of membranes to increase movements. Here we have some epithelial cells and this would be how long the membrane would be without the folding. However, folding of the membrane massively increases the surface area that is available. These microvilli are on the epithelial cells of the lining of the small intestine, increasing the surface area of the cell membrane. This is also known as the brush border. There are lots more carrier proteins to allow for more diffusion as well as co and active transports. Movement of glucose against a concentration gradient is via a sodium potassium pump. For example, when glucose moves from the small intestine into the blood. Here we have our epithelial cells, our bloodstream and the small intestine. Glucose is going to want to move from the small intestine into the bloodstream. Active transports will move sodium ions from cells into the blood, producing a concentration gradient with a higher sodium concentration in the lumen. Subsequently, sodium ions will now diffuse into the epithelial cells. As they enter, they bring a glucose molecule with them. The glucose that is now in the epithelial cells can now diffuse into the bloodstream. The body has a wide range of defense mechanisms. The first step is to stop pathogens getting into the body. In a variety of different ways, this can be using skin as a protective barrier, using snot to catch anything that's going in, same as with the nose hair, or using scabs to block up any holes. Step two is to fight the pathogens. This could be by phagocytosis. This is cell mediated involving T lymphocytes or humoral response involving B lymphocytes. Antigens are anything that the immune system recognises as foreign. These are generally cell surface proteins. When these are recognised, an immune response will be triggered. These can be pathogens, abnormal body cells or toxins. Phagocytosis. It is important to remember that a phagocyte is a type of white blood cell. 
receptors on the phagocytes will recognize antigens on the pathogen. The pathogen will interact with the phagocyte. The phagocyte will move around the pathogen, eventually enveloping it. Once the pathogen is contained within a vacuole, a lysosome, which contains lysosomes, fuses with this vacuole and the lysosomes are released. These can break down the pathogen. The phagocyte will then present the antigens and this will signal to other parts of the immune system. T lymphocytes are another type of white blood cell. We can have helper T cells. These signal to activate phagocytes and B cells. We can have cytotoxic or killer T cells. These will kill the foreign cells. An antigen presenting cell, a phagocyte, is recognized by the helper T cells triggering rapid division. This leads to a rapid increase in helper T cells that recognize the specific antigen. These will then activate the cytotoxic T cells, stimulate phagocytosis, and develop into memory cells for future responses. They will also stimulate the B cells. Cytotoxic T cells produce perforin, which leads to holes in an infected cell holds in the membrane that will lead to cell death. There is a large range of variety within B cells. As each of these produces a specific antibody. When a B cell meets a complementary antigen, it will become active. This is helped by T cells. This is called clonal selection and the B cells divide into plasma cells that release antibodies into the bloodstream. These are monoclonal antibodies. Memory B cells are long lasting and responsible for the secondary immune response. They don't produce antibodies, but can divide rapidly when they are needed. Antibodies are an important part in the immune system. They are made up from heavy chains, the long ones, and from light chains, the shorter ones at the side. There will be a receptor binding site and a variable region which will determine what it is an antibody against. And there will be two antigen binding sites. B cell clones can become memory B cells or they can become plasma cells. The plasma cells are the ones that produce antibodies. Each antibody has two identical binding sites that are specific to the antigen. There is a large amount of variety allowed in this. When the antibody binds to the antigen, a complex is formed. The two binding sites means the pathogen can be clumped together, leading to the destruction of the pathogen. The clumping together means it is easier for phagocytes to find. There are two different ways you can acquire immunity to something. This can be passive immunity, where antibodies are made by a different organism, such as when it is passed by breast milk, mothers passing antibodies to a baby or if something is given as an anti-venom injection. For this, protection is immediate. However, protection is only short term. 
No memory cells are produced and there is no exposure to the pathogen. We can also have active immunity, where antibodies are made by the immune system. This can happen as a result of catching the disease or the pathogen, or by be given a vaccine, one that includes the antigen. Time is needed for protection to develop. Memory cells are produced and this provides long-term protection for the individual. While vaccinations are important, so is herd immunity, as it is never possible to vaccinate 100% of a population. A good example of this is newborn babies. But if a large selection of the population is immune or vaccinated, then it is very unlikely that people who are not vaccinated will get ill as it is very unlikely that they will come into contact with the pathogen. In purple, we have our susceptible person. In blue, we have our immune or our vaccinated person. And in pink, we have our infected person. If there are lots of susceptible people surrounded one infected person, then lots of people will get sick. There are not enough people who are immune or who have been vaccinated to provide a herd immunity. However, if there are the same number, one of infected people, but the majority of people around them are either immune or vaccinated, then the few people in the population who would still be susceptible to infection are going to be protected because there is no way of directly transmitting to them, they are surrounded by a nice little protective bubble of immune or vaccinated people. There is little to no pathogen transmission. With vaccines, there are some ethical issues. Animals are used in testing and development of vaccines. There are some possible side effects. Human clinical trials are generally needed, putting human lives potentially at risk. And then there is a decision of who would get vaccinated first. And finally, should any vaccines be compulsory? Human immunodeficiency virus and acquired immune deficiency syndrome are more commonly known as HIV and AIDS. The HIV virus will have a capsid, it will have an envelope around that. There are attachment proteins all over the outside and this is an RNA virus and the RNA is in the middle, in the centre and along with it there is reverse transcriptase. This virus can make DNA from RNA. It is a retrovirus. The HIV will attach to the CD4 proteins and will frequently infect T cells. The capsid is injected into the cell and the reverse transcriptase turns the viral RNA into DNA, which is inserted into the cell's own genetic code. This means the T cells make more HIV, which are then released into the body. Since T cells are important for immunity and fighting viruses, a decrease in their numbers, since the host T cells die when they release new viruses, means that the body can't put up a defence against pathogens leading to AIDS or acquired immune deficiency syndrome. HIV itself does not cause death. It leads to other diseases which cause death. There are a wide range of uses for monoclonal antibodies, firstly in ELISA tests. ELISA stands for Enzyme-Linked Immunosorbent Assay. 
These are incredibly useful because they can detect very low concentrations of molecules. The sample being tested is on the slide. A specific antibody to the sample is added. A second antibody binds to the first antibody. An enzyme reaction happens, which generally leads to a color change or a result you can see. This is an indirect ELISA. You can also get a direct ELISA test, which will only use a single antibody. Monoclonal antibodies are used in these because they are all identical. Not only are they used in ELISAs, but they're used in diagnostic tests. For example, in pregnancy tests or in cancer treatment. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.